Hey hey, another chapter of One Piece and another set of details to break down. There's nothing massive being revealed this week, but we have a lot of cool linguistic tidbits here and there to break down, so let's get started. Our chapter begins by shifting the action from Onigashima to the flower capital, as everyone parties and rejoices in a traditional festival. We see Tsugaruumi, the old lady who taught Robin how to become a proper geisha, playing her shamisen alongside others. We see kids playing goldfish scooping, a mainstay in Japanese festivals you might have seen in some other anime, one of them even wearing a kitsune fox mask. And on the leftmost panel we see villagers beating the drums, which are also incredibly iconic to Japanese festivals and something we've seen being used in previous parties across the series. In the next panel we can see even more traditional festival activities including candy apples and corn being sold. And of course there's the large fire at the center of the plaza, which is not only present in many real-life Japanese festivals, but is also fitting narratively here given that this is the Fire Festival. Tengu Yamahitetsu explains how this Fire Festival honors the dead, with people lighting fires in the hope they can be delivered and reach even the heavens. Perhaps I'm reaching here, but this concept is similar to what Zoro mentioned about wanting his name to be delivered and reach even the heavens after Kuina's death, so perhaps that is a cultural element that carried through Kochiro since he too is from Wano. Otoko then wonders if Yasuya can see the fire, and Hitetsu assures her, after a grim reminder of the skies being so clear before Onigashima arrives, that he is certainly waiting to see what the future of the country will become. This is fitting, as Yasuya said he would await the good news from the afterlife as part of his final words. And as Kinemon told Okiku, surely the dawn of Wano will be delivered even to the world beyond, so surely Yasuye will be able to witness it once it happens. As I've already explained extensively, this entire festival is based on Japanese summer festivals, but even more than that, it is likely heavily inspired by the Obon festivities. Obon, which by the way is also the namesake for Bonkere's name, is a series of summer festivities that have the same purpose as the Fire Festival, the purpose of honoring the dead and attempting to reach those who have left us behind, with large fires and lights acting as a way to guide the dead. These festivals are always accompanied by partying, drums, and many of the activities we see depicted here. Back on Onigashima, Nami, Usopp and Atama manage to make it back to the life floor, but Ulti, as expected, has managed to recover, even from the attack of Ayonko, and tries to take care of Tama so that she cannot turn any more of their allies to the other side. Zeus thus suggests to use a Raitei to finish off Ulti. In case you forgot, Raitei, literally Thunderbolt, is one of Big Mom's iconic techniques, the same move she used to put down Judge in one hit during the tea party, so it should definitely be more than enough to put down Ulti. Considering how Big Mom didn't seem to put much strength into it and it seemed to mostly come from Zeus, this is certainly a devastating move even when being used by Nami. Nami however says she can attack as long as Ulti holds Atama, but Usopp helps with a Hisatsu Midoriboshi, or surefire green star, Sargasso. This is a move Usopp first used at the start of the post timescape to save the Kraken from falling rubble, if you can recall. Sargasso refers to the Sargasso Sea, a sea known for always being covered in thick seaweed, leading to the specific species of algae to be called Sargasso as well. Nami then prepares to attack, but Zeus asks to be given a new name, to honor the start of their new relationship. Nami, however, suggests... Wata. Wata means basically cotton, which is also par for the word for cotton candy in Japanese, wataame, and it sounds similar to a bunch of Japanese names such as Watanabe, so it makes sense as a nickname, but... It's definitely a bit uninspired, so Zeus just ignores her and decides to stick with Zeus anyways. By the way, speaking of Zeus, I don't think I've mentioned it before, but Zeus uses the Japanese first-person pronoun Oira. Oira is similar to Ore, but is considered a more childlike and playful, and is usually associated with cute or childlike creatures in anime, so it's a fitting choice for a fluffy cloud like Zeus to be using a pronoun like Oira. Before striking Ulti down, Nami says, 
Ikuayo or Here I Go, which is an iconic catchphrase she's used many times before finding many enemies across the series. Fans of One Piece games in particular might also recognize it for being used a lot in games as a generic battle line, given her use of it during battles in the series. Back to our much-awaited sequel of Roof Piece 2, Kaido has flown back onto the rooftop and challenged Yamato to a fight. However, Yamato refuses to be intimidated by Kaido and probably proclaims that he will leave for the sea alongside Luffy. This doesn't necessarily confirm anything really, it's nothing new, but it does show once again Yamato's intent to join Luffy's crew and how much he believes in Luffy. As someone who has been stuck for years on an island without ever being able to leave, to finally be able to set out to sea is his dream, and likely beyond that, seeing Luffy become the Joy Boy could be considered his own ultimate final dream, or, as I've put it before, to finally be able to exchange sake with Luffy at the very end of the series. Yamato also however states that he will drive off Kaido from Wano, but Kaido states that he stays there because it's the Wano country specifically. Now, this seems like it could potentially be some massive revelation, but it's possible it might also not be. On one hand, this comment could be alluding to something bigger, that, that perhaps Kaido knew of the legend that Joy Boy would one day come to Wano Country, just like Odin mentioned, so he was perhaps interested in that. Either out of interest to tame the ancient weapons and the One Pieces seems to be his ultimate objective, or perhaps so that Joy Boy could be even the one to kill him, which would explain his disappointment at saying that Luffy couldn't become Joy Boy and couldn't kill him either. At the same time though, this really could be something as simple as him wanting to remain at Wano because of its fortress like structure, something he praised as being so special that it makes it the perfect natural fortress to defend against any enemies, so it's hard to say just how much relevance this line really has, which will depend entirely on our own speculation. The chapter ends with an impressive clash between Kaido and Yamato, which causes some colossal black sparks to fly out of the dome, and for the clouds to move away. Now, we've seen Black Sparks so many times, even when Gankers Haki is not being used, so this isn't a guarantee of a Conqueror's Clash, but the size of them here is so big that... Uh, could it be? Could Yamato actually have Conqueror's Haki? Well, we don't know yet, so we can only really speculate. Kaido is clearly using Conqueror's Coding in the previous panel, so these sparks could simply be from his own attack. But personally, I don't think it's the case, because Yamato simply doesn't have the ambition to reach for the top, like Luffy or Zoro. His ambition is much more personal and humble, but I still wouldn't completely rule it out. Guess we'll just have to see. However, as Yamato readies for that clash, we see a certain detail that I feel has gone unrecognized, being that Yamato begins to visibly sweat and his face turns pale. For as ready as he might be, I'm sure that this is bringing some serious trauma back for him, and I doubt it's easy to face something he has been afraid of for so long, so it's commendable how Yamato has the strength to stand against his own trauma and the abuse he has received for years for the sake of those he believes in. And in that regard, Yamato states that he knows he cannot defeat Kaido, but he can at least stall him long enough until Luffy is back. Because he believes that Luffy is the man Odin, and by extent Roger, has been waiting for all this time. Yamato believes that Luffy is, quite literally, Joy Boy. This doesn't necessarily confirm anything, as it's Yamato's own speculation, and it's not like it's anything new. Yamato already told Momonosuke that he believes that Luffy is the one who will lead this new generation of pirates and change the world, much like Odin expected would happen. And as we've talked about, I don't think who will become the Joy Boy is set in stone, so this statement from Yamato is nothing more than his own belief. But Yamato still firmly believes that Luffy will be the one to become the Joy Boy. In that regard, much like everyone else, Yamato believes in Luffy, and there's nothing that makes him more of a potential Straw Hat candidate than believing in Luffy. That's all for this chapter. Do you think Yamato will join the crew? Do you even want Yamato to join the crew? Will Carrot ever reappear in this arc? Let me know, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.